Hi. Hi, Ali. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming to Belgrade. Thank you. Have you ever been here before? No, first time. First time, awesome. Uh, tell, welcome to HIPCON. Thank you. Um, tell me something. <laughs> <laughs> tell you something. Yeah, tell me something. Yeah, let, let's see something. I heard about something very particular ha thing happened in India or Indian men <laughs> with Indian men. Ah, uh, yeah, the <laughs> I forgot about this. The the Indian guy that ate my toenail. <laughs> mm, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a interesting story. Yeah, I um he, you know, he just hijacked my feet, and <laughs> he was, he was, he was, you know, reading my future, and he read my palm, and oh, really? he read my foot, and uh, the moment I had my head turned, he uh, clipped off my big toenail and yeah. ate it. Oh wow! I still <laughs> kind of feel like a part of me is missing, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> wow, who knows what happened then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, nice to have you here. Please, we want to hear your talk. Cool. Enjoy. Thank you. Hi, sir. So, um, yeah. Very excited to be here. Um, I'm probably just going to be like kind of hanging out here because I don't have a clicker thing. Um, but I'm always like really excited to have the opportunity to to come and talk about the work that I'm doing at at these kind of conferences, like uh, you know, in a room full of tech people, like my peers, my colleagues, um, because. I think like the people sitting in this room and rooms like this, uh, we we all think we know the web pretty well, and kind of collectively, we've we've played a pretty big part in in really defining and shaping like the digital technology that that we have today. So you know, like the hardware, the software, designs, conventions, everything. Um, but three or four years ago, I kind of moved from working in an agency context, working on products and sites. Uh, to start working with NGOs and companies in Africa on, on public health software. And I learned really a lot about, like, there's such a huge contrast between our experience of technology and what we think we know about it and the experience of this in emerging markets. So that's what I'm talking to you about today. Uh, I'm talking about what I've learned designing and building uh, and iterating on software for the next billion users of the internet. So I'm Ali. I'm the design lead at a company called Field Intelligence. Um, so Field is like, we're a tech company. We, we make software. Um, but our focus is on, on working on software and systems to strengthen healthcare access and systems in Africa. So our main office, most of our staff are in Abuja in, in uh, Nigeria. But we have people in Berlin, in Nairobi, and in London. Um, but as much as possible, as a company, as a team, we spend a lot of the time outside of our office in the field with our users. And this is often in really remote, sometimes kind of treacherous places. And we really want to get to know their lives and their culture and experience firsthand the challenges that they face. And we use this to, to really inform like what we build and how we build it. And I mean, when I first sort of flew to Africa the first time, touched down in Kano in northern Nigeria, I, I really realized how much of a gap in understanding I had, um, how big the contrast was between my former experiences and my new experiences. And it was daunting, but like really, really exciting as well, um, because this is really the like the frontier of technology, um, where people are really unburdened by expectations and habits. Um, they're not complacent or bored or fed up with anything. Um, there's this real energy and excitement, and a lot of talent and like a really a true hacker culture there. Um, and we really should be paying attention to these markets because there's so much potential for growth um, and creativity as these new markets start becoming like a real force. So this is the next billion. Um, I think it's worth kind of spending a minute defining who the next billion is. Um, it's sort of a common term that's used. Uh, and it's not like the next generation that's coming online in, in Europe or the US. It's, I mean, we're all pretty much plugged in already. Um, the next billion really refers to the next big wave of people in, in the developing world, in emerging markets that are getting access to connected computing devices for the first time. 
So most people here in the, in the developed world generally, um, we're already connected, we're consumers. I mean, not everyone, obviously, not everywhere. I, I'm sure we all have some noob friend or relative who you know, doesn't know how to use their printer or caps lock key. Um, but there's not really a huge potential for growth here. Um, so I'll just sort of give you some numbers here. Um, in Europe overall, about 80% of people are already online. And when you start moving into like looking at country stats, like in Norway and Denmark, that's close to 100%. The USA, surprisingly, is a bit lower. Generally, it's 75%. Uh, um, it's kind of surprising given the dominance of Silicon Valley, I guess, but there's a lot of inequality there. Canada, 88%. Australia, which is where I'm from, so I always have to put this in here, it's 85%. So you get the idea, you know, like um, a majority of the people in these places are connected, and whether that's via a, a desktop or a laptop device with high-speed broadband or um, a smartphone, sometimes very powerful, devices with um, cellular connections. So the next billion are these new internet users in really populous countries, like big emerging markets where connectivity rates are much, much lower. Um, so they're connecting from places like Sao Paulo, New Delhi, uh, Nairobi, Lagos, Kinshasa, and there's way more p potential for growth there. So somewhere like Mexico, Brazil, they both have about half of their populations online. South Asia as a whole, it's around a quarter. Um, and Sub-Saharan Africa, only about 20%. Um, it's, it's sort of higher in certain countries, but much, much lower in other countries. I mean, this is a big region. So somewhere like Somalia only has like 1% of its population has access to the internet. So I think you get the picture. This is like a huge amount of people in the world who they don't use the internet. They've never been online. They have never like ordered and tracked a delivery online. They've never ordered a cab online. They would have probably a lot of difficulty filling out any kind of online form. Uh, so they've never really used Facebook or messaging or email or anything like that. So the connectivity rate in these kind of countries has really lagged because of you know, inequality and, and lack of resources, but this is changing really quickly because the availability of really, really cheap handsets is increasing. So at a street market in Nigeria, you can buy a second or third hand uh, smartphone. Um, it'll probably be very poor quality. It might be a knockoff. Um, and also the cost of cell, um, mobile data has really, really decreased. Um, I mean, it's still expensive for a lot of people, but you can buy it anywhere, um, prepaid, little stores everywhere. So in Nigeria, for example, um, you can get around 300 megabytes of data for a small package for 500 Naira, which is about a Euro 20. And so for someone who doesn't have much wealth or resources, this really opens up a whole new world in terms of like, knowledge and communication and opportunity. So the barrier to entry to the internet is really getting much lower. Um, but it's definitely still there. Uh, for a lot of people, kilobytes are very precious. Um, keeping their devices charged is really hard. And they're having to learn for the first time how to interact with these kind of machines without really much instruction. <clears throat> um, and for a lot of people, these sort of older, non-connected devices are still their only really reliable means of communication. They can still call and message. So I'm really here today to sort of kind of pose a question to you, which is what can we uh, in the tech industry generally do to keep really lowering those barriers um, to you know, really fulfill this original egalitarian promise of the internet? Um, so that someone like Mariam here, who I met in uh, rural Guinea, and she got a phone for the first time in her 40s. She was given, provided this phone so that she could um, record details of malaria treatments in, in her little community, replacing this big paper book thing. Um, so that she and everyone else that's in her position can have some chance of the same access to services and opportunities as someone here or in the US. And I mean, this was a real sort of <laughs> journey of discovery for me personally, like coming from working on products and like really shiny brand experiences at, at like creative agencies. Um, and we were really sort of constantly chasing innovation or what 
we thought of as innovation, like new shiny stuff, slick UIs, uh, latest frameworks, um, you know, immersive user experiences. And I think we're understandably excited by, by the possibilities here with these, this world of like really powerful handheld devices and, and like super fast connections. I think that's completely understandable. Um, but when I started working with NGOs and nonprofits on software for public health in West Africa, which is three or four years ago, this involved tackling like really complex, really significant problems. And I kind of started to realize that this is where the cutting edge really is. So I was working on programs um, for vaccine delivery, for polio eradication, uh, the Ebola response, uh, African sleeping sickness. And you know, these are grave, these are urgent issues. Um, but the technological challenges are really significant and, and really fascinating. So it involved like mapping unsurveyed areas, uh, working around very poor, sometimes no connectivity, uh, doing things like visualizing epidemiological patterns, uh, disease vectors and surveillance, uh, designing mobile data tools for users with very low technical literacy, um, overcoming big logistical challenges of trying to get to remote or inaccessible settlements. And a lot of the time doing this like at quite big scale, like across multiple countries in Africa. So um, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Guinea, DRC, Kenya. And so what I really learned is that this is a different kind of digital landscape. Um, these are places where the conditions are very imperfect. Um, networks are very flawed. Um, technical literacy can be really low and every kilobyte really counts. And this is a world where sort of the, these very carefully crafted digital experiences that I had been working on, they really stutter and crawl and perplex people and often really just fail. So I work now at this amazing company called Field Intelligence, um, and we have a really great team, uh, and we're trying to help solve some of these problems. Uh, so like I said before, we're, we're a technology company. We use um, tech and design and data. Um, we have a fairly small kind of lean team, uh, and most of our staff are in, in Nigeria. I, um, I was looking for a team photo before, and this is kind of the best I could find, but I kind of like it. There's something a bit Baroque about it. Um, this is us like really trying to like just grimace our way through a uh, company-wide call with a really shitty connection in Nigeria. Um, so we're really focusing on using our skills to, to tackle some really big problems. We work with governments and other partners, um, sometimes on our own, uh, working on software so that users can deliver and track vaccines, malaria medication, HIV medication, um, services to help uh, community pharmacies stay stocked with essential medicines, um, programs to sort of train drivers, like informal transport workers, to handle and deliver these medicines. And Nigeria, where we're doing a lot of our work, is, is a huge country. It's 180 million people. Um, and some of them have, like especially up in the north, some of the worst health and economic statistics in the world. So we're really doing this as much as possible, like not in boardrooms or in strategy docs. I mean, of course we have those, but we really try and be on the ground where the problems are and where the challenges are. Um, we like to test our products with people in large communities, small communities, using their devices, uh, using their connections, um, and really observing firsthand how they react to interfaces and how their devices handle them. And it's really, really challenging. There's like unreliable power and connectivity and very, very poor infrastructure. Uh, and it's really, really hard to kind of grasp the scale of, of these challenges when you're working in a European context or a US context. So I want to just sort of go through some of the ways that we found of helping our users, um, so no matter what their background or their resources, to interact in these complex systems by giving them simpler and more intuitive ways of working. Um, 
And I also want to sort of give you like a good description of like the environments and the constraints um, and give you a bit of a UX framework to guide your thinking and also a few tips to get started. Um, and I should say that like every place is different. Uh, what happens in, in Nigeria or, or Kenya is not exactly how it's going to go down in India, but um, this is a good place to start. There are no easy answers or hard and fast answers, but these are some of the experiences that me and my team at Field really want to share. So the context here, um, there are a few fairly big and fundamental things to be aware of, um, and that is like the hardware or the devices that you see, um, the power situation, the network situation. So your typical hardware is, is going to be a mobile device. Um, they vastly outnumber the amount of laptops and desktops. A lot of people have only really ever used touchscreen devices. Um, I worked on one project where we trialed a, a tablet and a laptop version of the same app. And it was really, the laptop version was really not very successful. Um, it was very confusing for people who hadn't used laptops before, which was most people. Um, so the, the keyboard and the mouse or trackpad being separate from the screen was, was really unintuitive and took a lot longer, which I think is probably surprising for most developers here. Um, they were much harder to carry around and, and charge up. And the connectivity was via 3G anyway, via a USB stick. So mobile devices really rule the day. Um, and the kind of devices you see uh, generally on the lower end spectrum, uh, they look something like this. And they're almost always Android phones. Um, so a lot of them are actually knockoffs or Chinese made phones. These are some of the really common brands that you see. Um, Samsung devices are really on the top end of, of the Android devices. And Apple or iOS devices uh, are really, really rare. It's like a very small percentage of the user base. It's quite a status symbol. And a lot of people have a few phones. Um, whether this is to kind of like hack their signal, like have multiple uh, SIM cards on different networks when, they, when one flakes out. Um, but a lot of people will have like an old, a dumb phone, like a Nokia or something because you know the battery lasts for a week. Um, so if your smartphone dies, then you can still call or text. And you really get some real workhorses. Um, you get a lot of scratched up screens, like very poor quality, very damaged screens. Um, they're often very low resolution. Um, and oftentimes people put like glare protection films or like big rugged cases on them. So it's really like, it's generally not a very sort of tactile experience using a smartphone. Um, and as you can see, like people are very used to kind of working around uh, damaged screens. Um, charging your phone in sub-Saharan Africa can, can be a real massive pain in the ass. Um, I'm sure everyone knows this feeling of panic that you get when you have a 10% battery warning or something. I mean, you can imagine seeing that if you knew that you had to wait for another day before you could walk somewhere and, and charge your phone that's maybe five kilometers away. Um, so for this reason, because power can be so unreliable, um, you see charging stations around where you have to pay a fee to charge your phone. And if there is a building in a community that has reliable e electricity, so this was a, uh, a newly renovated health facility in rural Guinea, um, and it had solar panels. So I walked around this place and every single outlet in there had someone's phone charging there. Like people would come there, plug in their phones and come back a couple of hours later to get it. So they're very, very popular, these PowerPoints. Um, but this can be quite slow. Like um, if you're running off a diesel generator, it can take a couple of hours to charge a phone. And if you've got solar power, um, it can take a lot longer, like four to five hours. And I mean, I see a lot of talks recently about performance. I think there's been some here, which is really awesome. Um, you know, performance does matter. Um, but this is a place where it really, really matters. Like, I mean, because if your app or your website is, is sucking up someone's battery life for, for no good reason, then you know, you're responsible for making that person walk for an hour to their uncle's place to 
UC's generated charger phone. So for this reason, phones are turned off all of the time, um, or at least the data is turned off. Uh, people will buy a little bit of data to do something, turn it on, do their thing, and then turn it off again. So this saves data and money and their battery as well. Um, so if you're doing stuff like background sync or refresh, um, if you're using service workers, you need to be really smart about how you do that and keep that in mind. I think in places like um, Europe or the US, we, we tend to think of internet as a, as a basic utility now. Um, but connectivity in a lot of parts of the world is really never guaranteed. Um, I mean, even the power networks are down constantly. Uh, so you can't rely on power, you can't rely on internet. Um, and remote and rural areas often have really poor coverage. Um, and even in built up areas, that's true as well. And you very, very rarely see broadband or Wi-Fi. And of course, it's still really expensive for them. Like one euro 20 in Nigeria is, can be a lot of money. And because of that, um, you'll see Opera Mini used a lot. Um, and it, because it's the lightest in terms of uh, data usage and, and system requirements. So it's really good to have this as part of your testing process. Uh, yeah, so I want to give you a bit of a UX framework now. Um, I mean, tech users in Africa really do fall across a very broad spectrum of experience and resources and, and knowledge and education. Um, and a lot of people in West Africa are actually like really, really skillful users of technology. Um, they're really thriving tech scenes in a lot of, a lot of cities. Um, but obviously, it's always good to design for a very baseline experience to increase your reach and, and access. Um, so I'm going to cover a bunch of stuff quite quickly. <coughs> um, so let's start with uh, discoverability. So if something's not on the screen, in front of you in the viewport, um, then it, you might be in a bit of trouble. And I know, I think we all probably thought we'd moved on from this people don't scroll argument, but um, scrolling is actually a very unintuitive thing for, for novice tech users. So very long pages or um, off canvas navigation can be really hard to discover and use. <coughs> um, so this is a pretty classic example of a data collection form. Um, uh, we've discovered that having these really long forms that uh, take up a, a, a lot of space or go below the fold um, makes it very hard for like a, a newbie to realize that there's stuff underneath there. And I mean, this doesn't even get started with like validating form elements that aren't in view. So a good alternative that we found in general, where possible, is to use more of a sort of wizard style interface. Um, so you break things down to one main action per screen, keep everything in view, um, and this really sort of reduces the, the cognitive and decision making burden for the user. And really just try to avoid concealed elements where you can. Um, and a prime example here is the select or drop down tag. Um, this was um, a very common sort of scenario for us was a, a location hierarchy. Um, using GPS in, in remote areas is um, not very reliable and also very battery intensive. So we would ask the users to, you know, they're going out into like the jungles in, in Congo and um, testing little communities there. So they have to choose in the, um, this hierarchy, like their zone, the area, and then the village. Um, but select tags make, just made this really, really confusing. Like uh, if they, not everything was on screen, um, if they made inputs here and then went back and reset something, then everything else would be reset. So the alternative that worked much better for us was to just split it out, put everything on the screen, um, ask the user to choose their zone, area, et cetera, and, and show all of the options on the screen. Um, and I mean, this is it in use in, in Congo, and that worked really well. And good affordance, I think everywhere, but especially here is really, really vital. Um, so if something can be pressed, make it look like it can be pressed. Um, because these real world kind of metaphors really help users understand how to use your interface. 
Um, so make buttons much more buttony, make them look really obvious. Um, label things really well and combine icons with labels where you can because um, a label will sort of clearly explain something, but an icon will help people remember. So, I mean, if you look at the difference between these two buttons here, um, we've become very conditioned, you know, via um, sort of the evolution of design trends to accept this version on the left as a button. Um, but a lot of people just really haven't had this conditioning or this training or this exposure. Um, so to them, the button on the left, oh, sorry, the right, you might think that it's uglier, but uh, it's, it looks like something that you would click. <coughs> and speaking of clicking, um, people tend to click everywhere um, just to see what it does. So especially if your UI is a bit more flat, um, there's a lot of things there that look like it might be a button or something that does something. Um, so just press everything and see what it does, see how it reacts. Um, and there's this sort of real like lack of patience there. Um, so you need to be like, you need to sort of give instantaneous feedback. Um, and also because of this, it's a very good idea to sort of build in confirmation dialogues or warnings if, um, if, if people like tap on a destructive action and offer a clear path out of that as well. Um, moving on, um, you really can't rely on maps being very widely understood. Um, we've worked with a lot of drivers um, and they generally often have very little understanding or experience and they instead sort of rely on a very intimate kind of local knowledge or communal knowledge. So it can be a really good idea to try and use written directions uh, alongside a map. And animations have to be used very, very wisely, both in terms of comprehension and performance. Um, so animations in form elements can just be a nightmare, nightmare, can really distract from the task at hand. And this is like a material UI convention that really, really confuses people. But animations that really help illuminate or describe a spatial model. Um, so if you're moving forwards or backwards and you have animations to describe it, then that's super helpful. So they have to be intentional and purposeful. And it also really helps users learn gestures um, if, if the app responds in a way to their gesture. And gestures themselves take, a, take time to learn. Um, a novice user almost never understands gestures. Um, buttons are very easy to, to understand. They're there on the screen and you press them. So gestures are better used to um, as sort of a shortcut to actions that are available um, elsewhere. And where possible, you, it's really, really important to try and make your product like offline friendly. Um, try and think about all the points your product could fail without a network connection because as I've described, uh, it's, it's very, very unreliable. Um, Instagram, and I think you know, a lot of the big tech companies are, are starting to realize this and uh, they, they make their product work fairly well offline now and it used to just not really work at all. Um, but even when you do have a connection, it it's, can be really, really, really slow. Um, so <coughs> try and like, uh, there are things that you can do to try and make your UI look a little bit snappier or seem a bit snappier. So don't tie them, tie UI elements to network requests where possible. Oops. Um, and really like try and be consistent. I think this is something that we all should know as developers. Um, keep everything consistent so that users can help, users can learn and memorize um, even if their, their literacy skills are low. And really don't be afraid to make it fun, um, making it, um, giving sort of encouraging steps can, can really encourage users to stick with your app, uh, to, to help them learn. Um, you can insert little gamification elements and, and people tend to really love that. And when in doubt, um, you can just sort of steal from other well-known apps. Um, there are a lot of apps, I mean, so Facebook, WhatsApp and Gmail um, are very widely used. Um, so if you're ever in doubt, look at the navigation and UI patterns in those apps and, and you can emulate them. Um, 
And finally, just some, like, some tips for getting started, because you probably can't start changing your product or your whole UX straight away, um, or very quickly at least. So to get started, um, you can test on a low-end device, like a really, really low-end device, and engage in local tech e ecosystems. So probably the best thing you can do is like to just get a really shit phone and like maybe stamp on it a bit and put like a little bit of data um, on a really shit network and go out into the woods, and load it up with stuff so that it barely has any memory left, and see how your app performs under those conditions. <coughs> and there are a lot of really clever people um, who are very aware of these, these issues and these constraints and are working on solving these problems. So engaging with local tech ecosystems um, is really, really great um, to do that from the ground level, not just outsourcing, but to involve them in like strategy and decision making. So to summarize, like it's, I really want to encourage you to be really curious about um, the digital landscapes beyond the ones that we know about, um, to have empathy for those people, but really sort of do the research in, in those markets. And I found that African tech consumers are, are really demanding and informed once they become familiar with the technology. Um, despite being relative newcomers, they, they also want clear and reliable and smooth running mobile solutions. And you know, the things that matter to tech consumers here are the same things that matter to tech consumers in Africa. They just have to be way more creative about how they access it. So they want to be able to communicate, connect, um, be informed, great, great opportunity to like date people, to meet people, um, listen to music, take selfies, take photos. Um, and these, these environments can really teach us so much as builders of the web, um, which is to really teach us to strip, strip everything back to what's really essential um, and what's really interesting to know your users, to make things that are really useful and exciting to them, you know, to make things that you want other people to enjoy and not just your cohort. And the capacity of people in these low resource environments to hack stuff to make it work for them, it astounds me, it's amazing. Um, and if we can learn from and tap into that ingenuity, then we in this sort of global tech community can build really, really powerful stuff. Um, we just really need to be curious about the world beyond our own limited borders. And I mean, you don't have to go to Africa or India to discover this because, or for it to be useful to you, because everyone really benefits from reducing complexity, from having offline capable apps, um, from having very performant websites. And you know, there are problems everywhere, there are problems here. Um, the context in Africa is just really, really exacerbated. So the next billion is not about the number per se. Um, it's not about a particular place. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a step backwards. Uh, I really think it's just a metaphor about uh, the idea of the future of the internet that's gonna be really shaped by this exponential growth in connectivity in the developing world. And I think it's something we should all be excited to be part of. Um, and I really hope that we can get more like African voices up on stages like this, telling these stories and talking about their experiences. So thank you.